This is Holding Court with Patrick McEnroe. All right, welcome back to Holding Court, everyone. Dr. Jim Lair joining me here. Fascinating conversation. Doc, when you look at where the world is, not just the tennis world. I mean, we know we've had Naomi Osaka put out there her mental health issues in the last couple of years. That was at the French Open. Of course, we hope she comes back. Uh, she'll be a mom when she comes back to the tour, which we hope will be uh, next year. How do you think we just as a, as a society are doing in the tennis world, of course, the professional realm, but also just in general? I mean, I see obviously in our world of tennis um, what I call the over-professionalization of youth sports, which I think is happening, you know, not just in tennis, but in a lot of sports. So how do you think we're doing as a society overall balancing those pressures and being able to have more of these conversations about overall mental health. So it's a really interesting issue. When I started, when someone, uh, most people never wanted to say that they were working with a psychologist. And so I, it was very hard for me to actually put my feet into any kind of a career because athletes were ashamed to talk about it. It was almost like, even though it was in the area of mental toughness, it suggested you have an emotional or psychological weakness. Because psychology was about, you know, basically, you know, trying to fix things that were somehow not aligned properly mentally or emotionally. And uh, but that whole era now has shifted. There's another whole kind of framework around positive psychology. And it really has, you know, I, I look at exercise physiology, you know, you look at almost all the sports, everyone has an exercise physiologist in, in the Early years, no one had one. It was right. like, you know, you just you just did your thing. You played your sport. But now everyone, now they have nutritionists. And now they have people that they can seek out from the mental and emotional side. Just like you're at your academy, you have a mental performance coach and everyone sees them as part of the team. So it elevates this. It's not a weakness to seek help in this area. It actually is just another strength that will help you become a stronger person and a better competitor. So the visibility now that Naomi Osaka and Raducanu and, and so many of the players now, they're very open about this. I think it's absolutely terrific. And you're right. I don't think there's ever been more pressure. I had a conversation last night with a mother whose daughter just got into UCLA. And she is literally every second, she's a very high level competitor. She's competitive in everything. She has no time in her life, no space. There's no, not a lot of joy. It's all meeting these performance expectations. And her mother knows when she gets into UCLA, it's going to be nothing more but a complete line of additional pressures in sport as well as in her academics. And she asked me the question. She said, how do you ever prepare kids for this? Everything is like maximum effort. There's no time to just kind of smell the the roses and enjoy your life. And the kids begin to wonder, is this what life is all about? Will I ever have a time to sit back and kind of reflect on the kinds of things that I really want to do and, joy, and the joys in my life? And I thought it was a great question because that's what's happening. And so parents and coaches have to realize, I worked out this stress recovery relationship that where every dose of stress, you have to have an equivalent dose of recovery or you start to get closer to burning out and your ability to enter the zone and enter this special ideal performance state goes away. We've got to understand we are all oscillatory creatures in an oscillatory universe. And every biopotential in human physiology is oscillatory. Nothing is a straight line. It's all energy expenditure and energy recovery. And, if, and we have to do that physically, emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually. Spiritually meaning your deepest values, your beliefs, what you care about, um, your purpose in life. We have to replenish that. And if we don't get the right balance, people get out on the edge and they lose the joy in life. And a lot of kids just can't take it. Parents keep pushing. And unfortunately, they should be pushing for balance or some kind of, you know, sense of, of how, how all this comes together in life so that you have a great life and you can enjoy your life. And uh, so I'm always talking to parents about this issue. It's not just pushing, you know, for a long time, everyone thought whoever, for instance, in golf, whoever hit the most balls is going to be the best. 
And so they have their kids out there hitting millions of balls with bloody hands. Mm. I've witnessed it. I've been right next to them. And they just say, you have to gut, gut it out. And one day you will thank me for this. Mm. And I say, no, no one's going to thank you for this. What you're doing here is almost a form of child abuse. You've got it wired up wrong. So immediately I get fired because they don't want to hear that message. Right. And uh, But I, I've tried to be uh, on that wavelength for most of my career. And I'm very happy that the USTA and the Sports Science Committee um, is really understanding and really putting a lot of their intellectual knowledge in helping players find balance. The WTA has done a remarkable job in their player development uh, efforts to try to help protect players through this journey. And I have such great respect for all of them um, uh, that, that have, have worked so hard. They've made a huge contribution and they've affected all women's sports uh, because they have been, they've been out in front leading the way on that. And I, I have had great admiration for all the people on that uh, on that committee, it's been um, and that age elig age eligibility committee that has tried to protect these young players from the the in enormity of the pressure. And you see it when they finally win a great tournament, or maybe out of the blue, all of a sudden they go into a spiral mm. because the pressures are so great, and it's really hard to prepare a 19 or 20 year old for those pressures. The your new book, you've it was your 18th book, and of course you've run the gamut between mental performance, <laughs> mental health, you know, working for uh, some big companies as you've done. You got into the corporate world. You started your own institute, the Human Performance Institute, which you obviously ran for many years. Talk a little bit about your latest book because you, you just never stop rolling, Doc. Well, I have to tell you, you know, I've been around a long time and an old guy. My, my grandkids refer, my kids refer to me as ancient ruins. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly. So, uh, yeah. But... I, I'm always reflecting on what I've learned and what uh, all the roads led to the same place. When I looked at all the work I've done, ultimately, I wish I had come to this early in my career. Ultimately, our lives are the result of the choices we make. The decisions that we make um, actually determine our destiny. And we have to really look at in, in a single hour we can in a single day. Let's just start there. We can make as many as thirty-five thousand decisions mm. in a in a given week. Two hundred and forty-five thousand decisions, and in the course of one year, one point two million decisions. The question I have is: What are you referencing? How are you making those decisions? A great, um, brilliant uh, scientist by the name of Daniel Kahneman wrote a book, a best-selling book called "Thinking Fast and Think Thinking Slow." And what he did was he, he helped us understand how this neural processor between our ears operates in two ways, fast and slow. Most of the decisions we make are made quickly. We don't even think about them. But the big decisions that are most important are, are those that need to be very, very carefully vetted. I developed this notion along with my co-author, Dr. Sheila Walker Olson, who has her PhD in, in behavioral genetics, brilliant, brilliant scientist. And we came to understand that we all have inside of us uh, our own personal advisor. And we came to call it Yoda, your own decision advisor. Mm. And that decision advisor has to be kind of trained to make the best decisions at the right time. We don't teach, parents don't know how to teach decision making. They don't teach it in grade school or elementary school. They don't teach it in high school. They don't teach it in college. They don't teach it in business schools for the most part. And it's the most important competency we have as human beings. And so we did a science-based approach to digging all the information that we know about making good decisions and applying it to you know parents, teachers, coaches, actually applying it actually in sport. Sport is a wonderful way. Tennis, how many decisions you have to make mm on the court constantly, shall I stay engaged? Shall I show, you know, making a, uh, a bad line call? Um, and what, how should you uh, respond to being cheated? There are, you know, countless decisions. I go cross court, shall I come in? Shall I stay back? Do I need to be more patient? That decision-making process in tennis 
can be extrapolated into all kinds of positive learnings in life. Holding Court is powered by Mudhouse Media.